<laughs> Eileen, let's talk a little bit about borderline and, and you know, the uh, resectabilities in the eye of the beholder. So we've gotten a lot of folks getting sort of a preoperative approach. Can you talk a little bit about that in yeah. theory? And, and uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about the data to support that. So this is a very topical area in pancreas cancer, borderline and resectable, and where the, the, the limits are in terms of the definitions. And I think we all realize there's uh, very nice uh, prints on paper of where these actually fall, but in truth, it's a spectrum. Uh, and increasingly, I would say, and, and my colleagues may disagree with me here, but increasingly, I think a pragmatic approach is resectable or borderline. We're going to be giving all these patients upfront neoadjuvant therapy, and we may not necessarily, because we know we're not very good at this, predicting who's going to go on to uh, get surgery at the end of the day. I think things that are encouraging are when patients' symptoms improve, when their CA99 goes down, but we know radiographic and this goes to Tony's point a minute ago about novel imaging approaches to be able to understand who's responding. This may help select and increase the potential for identifying patients uh, who are going to benefit from, from an operation. I'm always surprised that, you know, we don't see a lot of change on imaging after a few cycles or a few months and then the, but the marker's down and we explore those patients anyway and find that, oh, by the way, the tumor kind of pops out of there. And so is that a modality, even if the imaging is not supporting a regression, do you explore them anyway and hope that you're going to be one of those uh, resectable uh, patients? Yeah, I mean, I, to, to Tony's point, I think it's a combination of factors that play into this. So, you know, obviously CN99 response is, is important, I think. Um, and it, as, as you say, imaging is not everything. You know, I think the MD Anderson group showed nicely that uh, a large percentage of the patients who did not have a response on imaging, uh, borderline resectable, did go, were able to go on to resection. So um, again, it speaks a little bit more to, to a little bit to um, the experience of the surgeon, mm -hmm. the comfort, you know, how comfortable they are in that in that. Area of but the that's back to your point. You need to be in a center where they're doing this, right? Right, <laughs> right. And and you want so that surgeon to be high Exploration is fine, right? you know, um, as long as that surgeon is um, willing and able to say no when it's appropriate and to say what yes that's when it's that's appropriate. A good point. Right? It's a really good point. George, let's take it one step a little further, and that is what if it's a locally advanced and everybody's sort of agreeing that this is not a resectable candidate. There's some new data, it's about a, you know, six months old out of GI ASCO, of giving some frontline uh, neoadjuvant, quote unquote, uh, chemotherapy. Um, you want to review the LPAC or LAPAC or what do we call it? LAPAC. Yeah. Trial? Yeah. It's French, it's LAPAC. Trial. LAPAC, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I mean, what's, what's going on right now? We are still trying to decide what chemotherapy to use. Is it fulfirinox or is it uh, uh, gemcitabine, uh, nabpacotaxel? So uh, there's a lot of discussion and I think uh, some work out of the Alliance has shown that uh, Fulfirinox may be good in that setting, but this trial actually helps understand what the value of uh, nabpacotax on a, um, a gemcitabine are. So this is a about 100 patient trial, uh, local advanced unresectable patients. Uh, they got conventional uh, treatment with the Braxane, uh, nabpacotax on gemcitabine. Uh, about 50% of patients were able to tolerate six uh, cycles or six months of treatment. And uh, they subsequently went on to additional therapy. 12% uh, continued on the chemotherapy. 16% went on to radiation. And 15, one five, 15% went on to surgery, of which half of the patients had R0 uh, resections. Uh, side effects obviously were neutropenia, but otherwise well tolerated. So it really helps us bring nabpacotaxel, gemcitabine into the discussion that it can be used in the neoadjuvant setting. So very helpful. So this was like unheard of in some way. I mean, these were patients that we were never going to operate on uh, in, in our traditional algorithms. And now we're seeing that chemotherapy, although not a huge number, but 15% is not inconsequential, that it's worth sort of approaching that. Are you bold enough to tell a patient that you're thinking this way? I, I definitely tell a patient up front that with locally advanced disease that, hey, you know, there is a very good chance that we're not going to be able to get this tumor out. Um, but it's a matter of time and observation, and we'll take it one step at a time. But I, I think that the neoadjuvant realm is also a very a, a great area for us to explore the activity of new agents. Um, you know, we've seen at this at this conference also uh, the, the use of an anti-CCGF agent targeting the stroma, increasing that resection 
rate, and um, and so uh, there's it, I think there's a lot of room for improvement certainly. In the unresectable patient, Eileen, that has some frontline chemo that doesn't enjoy this benefit to surgery. Is there a role for radiation in this patient? Yeah, I think that's an open question and you can argue to continue chemotherapy, to stop chemotherapy, or you may choose to include radiation. Uh, the uh, the LAP07 study from Europe suggested there wasn't a huge advantage, although it may help in terms of delaying when people need to go back on therapy and those that are symptomatic, there may be a benefit. Sort of local control, pain relief, future pain relief, that yes. kind of thing. Yes, so I think it's, 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 it's an open question. I've always tended to do it, um, and, and based, you know, based on not much, um, but just a hunch that's the right thing. I saw, George, you're shaking your head a little bit there, too. Yeah, I was nodding my head. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I agree that uh, radiation has a value. In uh, this setting, I mean, this, in this chemo setting. first, unresectable still, maybe radiation. So let's stir point. the pot here. What do you do? So you give a couple months of chemotherapy. It's very hard to measure response in the primary tumor uh, as it is. Uh, so then what do you do? So you don't get a response. Do you give more chemotherapy? Do you go on to radiation? I'm a believer that maybe more chemo and then maybe radiation. Radiation still causes a, a what, 30% response rate, so it's still a value. And then the other benefit is that you do get pain control. Uh, they showed that early on, a uh, long time ago, Mike Haddock showed that you do get uh, pain relief. So Stereotactic radiation, traditional five weeks. Stereotactic, because you don't want to tie the patient up. Get in there five days. You don't want to do five and a half weeks of radiation. I don't That's, know. I'm so a believer. We have a debate so here. I, 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 she well, agrees. No, she's just, of course, she I always agrees agree with you. Yeah. No, in New York, you have to pay to park every day. So yeah. is yes. it five? Is it 25 doses? I think this or is, is an open doses? question. Yeah, right? really so, so, you know, the field has walked with their fees in terms of moving away from the more traditional five and a half weeks of chemo radiation. It's hard for patients. Mm -hmm. It's tiring probably the uh, side effects overall are worse, but we certainly don't have randomized data to tell us that SBRT is a better way to go. And if you speak to some of our radiation colleagues, some have very, very strong opinions right. about what radiation strategy we now should be proton, using. Now it's proton, baby. you got to have a proton. Proton or ablative dosing yeah, of radiation. <laughs> we, we have to be, hey, we have to be careful. I think, I think the, the, the data overall does not support the role of radiation. I don't think 30% is realistic from radiation in this disease as a response rate. In fact, I don't think radiation adds much of a response uh, to this. Uh, the, what, what I hear from my surgeons when we have the discussion about SBRT versus uh, uh, traditional chemo radiation uh, is as follows. If the patient is not now considered resectable, uh, or if, is, if the patient I'm sorry, is considered resectable, I don't need a pinpoint or a smaller field radiation. I can do that and clean it up surgically. Yeah. What I need is I need the bed, the whole bed, including the lymph nodes, to be radiated because I want an R0 resection because that's the best uh, way we're going to actually get those patients uh, through survival. Remember, this is only 10 to 15 percent of the patients. Uh, uh, and so, so it's really limited. And I want to coin a term, though. A very, right now, you're going to hear it right now? No, no, a, okay. yeah, a coin a term. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I give credit to Mark Bloomston, one of my surgeons. Is, uh, so we shouldn't be talking anyway. I mean, we see that there's a lot of gray zones between the borderline, also some borderline, borderline, and, and, and locally advanced, and pretty much treat them the same, although we may diverge at the end. These should be called advanced non-metastatic cancers, mm. pancreatic cancers, and they can fit different shades of gray. So I, you know, I sort of blame ourselves in some level for our lack of, of progress because we, as a, as a group, I think maybe out of desperation, we, we move new technologies forward without a lot of organized study. You know, I think our breast cancer colleagues, our lung cancer colleagues have been, I think, more methodical in their clinical research. And I, I do wonder on some level if our trying to, you know, incorporate and make leaps has in some way impaired our, our outcome.